the arena of racial justice, so, uh, social justice, poverty, and homelessness for a large nonprofit in Dallas. So that's what I do. And I want to just kind of introduce this one today by showing you something else on the screen. So this is my handout for the book, Extreme Ownership, um, How U.S. Navy Sail Seals Lead and Win. Uh, it was written in 2015, as you can see, by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. That is a book that I have presented in multiple cities. Here's an example. In the city of Denton, Texas, they have asked me to present this multiple times. They were bringing in new groups of employees and wanted them to hear this book. Um, I love this book. And uh, they wrote, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin wrote a follow-up called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And then uh, another book called Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. Uh, there's something very uh, graphic and tangible about the stories out of their Navy SEAL experience. And I really love this one quote from Extreme Ownership it's number 21, and here it is. When leaders who epitomize extreme ownership drive their teams to achieve a higher standard of performance, they must recognize that when it comes to standards, as a leader, it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate. Boy, do I like that quote. You get what you tolerate. So when you end up tolerating a lower standard, that becomes the new normal standard. So you've got to raise the standard and not tolerate anything less than the excellence you aim for. So that's a line from extreme ownership. Now, I want to tell you that that this book, The Wisdom of the Bullfrog, let me stop sharing, the Wisdom of the Bullfrog is kind of the new top leadership book. Um, if people ask me what's the best book on leadership, it's almost impossible to answer. You've got uh, multiple books by um, Liz Weissman on impact players and multipliers. You've got great books from sports like 11 Rings by the great NBA coach Phil Jackson. You've got multiple books by military leaders, and then you've got books by generals uh, like Ma General Mattis and books about CEOs, uh, not often by CEOs, but biographies of Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And some of these people are not great people, but they get results. Um, I'm a fan of servant leadership, where the leaders serve the people they lead. And these books by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, the Navy SEALs, and this one by Admiral McRaven, The Wisdom of the Bullfrog, very much fall into the servant leadership umbrella. So I'm very high on that. Now, if you've never been, uh, never attended, never viewed one of my book briefings, let me just quickly acclimate you. The handout is very important in following along. You can reread this on your own once and you'll really get the book more deeply into your mind and into your heart. But here's the order of items on the handout. I start with what is the point of the book? And then I have why is this book worth our time? And then I have a few pages of direct excerpts from the book, the best of Randy's highlighted passages. And I've got quite a few. And when you see a passage that is in bold or a larger font, that's my emphasis on that quote. It's my saying this one's an especially important one. And then uh, if you've got a printed copy, you can jump ahead to page seven. And I have what I call the thesis quotes these are the most important, summarize the book in a in one excerpt quotes. And then I have who's the author, uh, the key points of the book, 
And then I end my portion of the handout with my lessons and takeaways. And so is this as good as you reading the book for yourself? Of course not. It's always better and the great leaders read a lot of books. But I'm willing to bet that even if you read this book, if you reread my handout, it would remind you of some of the key points. So um, I do a little bit of jumping around. I'm going to start with one quote on page three. It's near the bottom, number 22. And here is the quote. In his book, The Speed of Trust, that's a book I have presented for SGR and for cities. Stephen Covey, this is the son of the famous Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In his book, The Speed of Trust, Stephen Covey says, there are two components of trust. Circle these. Character and competence. This book, the Wisdom of the Bullfrog, Leadership Made Simple but Not Easy by Admiral McRaven is really a book about character and competence. The reason you can trust the good leaders is they are people who are people of character and they are good at what they do. They have competence. Either one of those missing, you've got bad leadership. If a person is not reliable, a full of integrity, a person of character. You don't want anything to do with them. You cannot trust them because they are not trustworthy. On the other hand, if they are very trustworthy, but not very good at what they do, then you also can't trust them. So I think that's really a key point in this book where he calls, uh, he pulls it forth from Stephen Covey, trustworthiness is character and competence. Now, I'm going to tell you three major stories from this book, but not yet. We're going to get to that point a little bit later, but there are three stories that capture the essence of this book. I will tell you that Admiral McRaven was the longest serving Navy SEAL, and they were first called frog men. And that's why the longest serving Navy SEAL is called the Bullfrog. So that's where that comes from. And by the way, if you are not aware, the word SEAL is always capitalized. It's an acronym. It is uh, Sea, Air, and Land. So that's why you see SEAL in capital letters. And Admiral McRaven was the ultimate boss of Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And so he was the head seal. And uh, one of the things that he is most famous for is that he made the decisions regarding the raid on Osama bin Laden that killed Osama bin Laden. That's mentioned in this book. Uh, it is also mentioned in other books that I have presented. So, so he was the top of the heap of the Navy SEALs when they went after Osama bin Laden. After his Navy SEAL days, he became the chancellor of the University of Texas uh, system, and he gave a very famous graduation speech called Make Your Bed, and he's got a book called Make Your Bed, and if you've never heard that speech, it is worth hearing. So that's the background. Now, I'm on page one. Keep your pen handy. Get ready to circle items. And here we go. What is the point? Good leadership is rare and hard to come by. But it can be learned. This book can be your teacher. So that's my statement of the point of this book. I don't need to warn you of what happens when there is a bad leader. It hurts the reputation of the organization. The people are floundering. The morale is low. The better organizations have the better leaders. And people trust their leader. The leaders trust the people. 
They give them more freedom to make decisions because everybody trusts each other. I've just read a book and presented a book called The Geek Way by Andrew McAfee that talks very specifically about the way leadership decisions were passed down in Netflix to the people making decisions. It's a great book, The Geek Way by Andrew McAfee. And so that would be uh, something that that uh, Admiral McRaven and Jocko Willink and Leif Babin would, would echo. All right, why is this book worth our time? Number one, this book is a reflection, a memoir, on the most important leadership lessons learned written by a seasoned, accomplished leader. Admiral McRaven is saying, this is what I've learned over my lifetime career of leadership. Number two, this book is a gold mine of stories of successful leadership stories, and also a few stories of failures worth heeding. Number three, this book is an illustration of clear and simple communication. View it as a model for how you can and should communicate. Let me make a, a little side comment here. This is a book with short chapters. It's written very wisely with key lessons in short chapters. It's the kind of book you ought to keep on your desk especially if you're in a leadership position. That way people will know that you're reading about leadership. And when you've got a few extra minutes, you can open it up anywhere in the book and pick one of those short chapters. That's a real value to this book. Turn to page two, the first inside page. I'm going to read not anywhere near all of these highlighted passages, but a few of them. Number two, Carl von Clausewitz, the great 19th century general who wrote the consummate book on war, once said that everything in war is simple, but the simple things are difficult. You know, if you listen to any person after a football win or loss, there's going to be some hint of this kind of phrase. Our coaches gave us a good game plan, that's a strategy, and we executed the game plan. Strategy and execution. That's leadership in a nutshell. That's organizational success in a nutshell. nutshell. They're doing the right things, that's strategy, and they're doing them very well. That's execution. And if you get either of those wrong, if you're doing the wrong thing really well, it doesn't help you. If you've got the right strategy, but you don't execute, you have failed. So this idea that you decide the right stuff in war, and then you make it happen, the simple things are difficult. Look at number seven. The most tragic thing in the world is a man of genius who is not a man of honor. That's a line from George Bernard Shaw. Remember, all of these are directly from the book. This book really parks on the idea of honor and integrity. Uh, look at number 11, the cadet honor code. A cadet will not lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. So if you are a liar, a cheater, someone who steals, you are you have no business in a position of leadership. But if you turn a blind eye to such, you also have no business being in a position of leadership. So I'll continue reading here. Below the honor code is the mission of the United States Military Academy. The mission of West Point is not to produce Patton-esque geniuses, four-star generals, or presidents of the United States. The mission is to produce leaders of character. And the honor code provides the foundation of that character. If you look at page three, I'm not going to read these. 
You can read the honor codes of the other branches of the service and a couple of groups. Uh, number 12, I will say the modern seals codified the standard of conduct, which says I will serve with honor on and off the battlefield. Uncompromising integrity is my standard. Boy, this is a real challenge in today's world. No matter what your job for your city is or your organization, somebody is going to take your picture somewhere doing whatever it is you're doing. And so you've got to serve with honor on and off duty wherever you are. And that's really an, an interesting reminder of the world, the current world we live in. Uh, number 17, more often than not, and by the way, uh, you can read those on your own. And my brother, who is a retired Air Force colonel, I sent him this handout and he said, let me throw in the Air Force coat of honor. It was missing. So, so they have their own that's very uh, parallel to these others. Number 17, more often than not, that lack of integrity, doing wrong instead of right, can manifest itself in a toxic work culture, a failed business, or a personal tragedy. If you violate your oath, your code of conduct, the basic decency with which you should live your life and run your business, then eventually you will lose the respect of the men and women you serve and the opposite becomes your fate. Well, let's keep going. I wish I had time to read all of these. Turn to page four. I'll read number 34, uh, 33 and 34. Movies that show great successes and big challenges don't have time in the script to show all the planning and preparation that go into an operation. No one would read the books if half the chapters were about the military planning. In the three weeks, number 34, leading up to the bin Laden raid, the team spent 75% of their time planning the mission. The president remarked that while the confidence level on bin Laden actually being in the compound was only 50%. Boy, that was a gutsy leadership call. He had 100% confidence in the Navy SEALs, the Hilo crews, and the intelligence professionals who were conducting the mission. And so um, what this book reminds us of is that when you get ready to do the thing, that you are seeking to do. But before you do that, you have to plan and rehearse. I don't have time to tell you about the story behind the helicopter crash that was done, not a real crash, but a simulated crash on purpose in rehearsal for the Navy SEALs attacking the compound. And then when they attacked the compound, the way they rehearsed the crash actually happened. They were ready for it. You got to get ready for it. And then uh, number 36, different subject. Um, in the room was my boss, General Stanley McChrystal. He paused, we need a network to defeat a network. In city government, you have many instances where you rely on the police or the firefighters or other people from surrounding cities. You need to have a good relationship with multiple city leaders around you because you need a network to defeat a network. Well, not only do we intend to build a network around the globe, but we also need each of you to provide us with your best people so we can create an interagency task force. Uh, General McChrystal has a book called Team of Teams that I have presented that talks about building this team of teams. All right, look at page five, number 51. 
in every command tour I had, trooping the line, those daily walks around the building, the base or the camp, always yielded great insights into how well the organization was doing and how well I was leading. Uh, Tom Peters and Bob Waterman in the book In Search of Excellence decades ago said that you need to manage by wandering around. Well, trooping the line is the military version of managing and leading by wandering around. You run into people, you talk to them, you ask them how they're doing, you see what they have to offer. And all of that really does matter in them trusting you and you trusting them. Turn to page six. Number 52. I love the imagery of this paragraph. Mounted on a large white horse with full military regalia on his uniform and two immense pistols holstered at his side, General Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben rode into Valley Forge in February of 1778. One soldier recalled von Steuben's arrival as if though it was the fabled god of war himself. Soon after his arrival, Washington made von Steuben the Continental Army's Inspector General. Corruption and graft were rampant as soldiers received and then sold their muskets and other equipment. Within days, von Steuben had initiated inspections of the troops and their tents and their rifles and their combat equipment. And during the winter of 1778, von Steuben wrote the regulations for the order and discipline of the troops of the United States, a document that has been the foundation for the American military since it was first published. Let me remind you of something in the news right now. There was an airplane, a Boeing airplane, where an outer door flew off and it was a miracle in flight. And it was a miracle that no one was killed. And what was missing, we have now learned, were four bolts. They needed von Steuben's inspection of the equipment. Sometimes making sure everything is done right is a life-saving discipline. So I thought of that when I heard that on the news. Number 54, in the insightful book, The Smartest Guys in the Room, The Amazing Rise and Scandalous Fall of Enron, a number of senior employees within the organization knew that something was wrong, but the company was making millions, so they let it slide. The after-the-fact rationalizations by the accused executives were strikingly similar to the mindset that brought about the Enron disaster in the first place. The arguments were narrow and rules-based, legalistic in the hair-splitting sense of the word. In other words, they knew it was wrong and they let it happen. Number 55, the last one I'll read. If you're a leader, circle and memorize. Number 55, sooner or later, the actions of every leader will be scrutinized both externally and internally. Well, those are some of the highlighted passages. Turn to page seven, so you'll know what we're doing. I'm going to speak until about 1140, and then we're going to take some questions and respond to some questions. All right, top of the page seven. For thousands of years, militaries have relied on mottos, creeds, parables, and stories to inspire, to motivate, and to guide leaders and followers alike. These sayings serve to reinforce certain behaviors. They also provide a memory prompt. And you're going to hear plenty of these, as we already did in the Code of Honor. In this book, I have collected 18 of these sayings. 
that have guided me throughout my career, mottos, parables, creeds, and stories that have served me well when I was starting a new assignment or had a particularly difficult leadership challenge. And then the next one, go ahead and circle this one. The Army Rangers sua sponte, of your own accord. We're going to come back to that. The British Special Air Service motto, who dares wins. And the SEAL mantra, the only easy day was yesterday. All these sayings have a storied history that, have dri that drove leaders at the time to make certain profound decisions. And they are words born of experience, trial by fire, and most are written in blood. We have never stopped raising the bar and trying to be the best. Well, I'm not going to read about Admiral McRaven. I've told you about him. Here's an observation at the bottom of page seven. This book delivers. The subtitle is Leadership Made Simple, but Not Easy. Simple, not easy, simple. Short chapters, almost a daily reading link chapters. Buy this book, read it a chapter at a time, reread my handout, and it will make you a better leader. So that's my promise to you. Let me rephrase that. If you do what it says. If you do what it says. All right, turn to page six. What is leadership? Uh, in this part of the handout, anything in italics comes directly from the book. In its simplest form, leadership is accomplishing a task with the people and resources you have while maintaining the integrity of your institution. So you get it done. It's the right thing to get done. You get it done well, and your institution, your organization, is even more deeply respected. That's leadership. But leadership is not just about getting the job done. It's about maintaining or advancing the reputation of your institution. If, as a leader, you fail the institution you are leading, then you have failed, period. As a leader, you must take actions to build a plan, communicate its intent. This is really worth circling because it tells you the tasks of leadership. To build a plan, to communicate its intent, to inspect its progress, to hold people and yourself accountable. It's what you tolerate. Together, qualities and actions are the building blocks of great leaders, but true honor, doing the right thing for the right reasons, is the foundation of great leadership. All right, here's the book. I'm going to read all of the chapter titles, and I'm going to pause at three to five of them. All right, here we go. Chapter one, Death before dishonor, be a person of integrity. If you want to be a great leader, you must have a personal code of conduct that provides an anchor for your decisions and your actions. Um, I recently spoke to a city. I'm not going to give you any hints, but in this city, there is a nearby city that has really been harmed by corruption. Some leaders in that nearby city have been found out to be corrupt. It is on the tongue of everybody how bad that was. So imagine if you're working in a city where leaders are corrupt, what that does to your reputation. Chapter two, you can't surge trust. Be trustworthy. He talks about being in a group with a big challenge. 
we don't have to, we won't have to spend time getting to know each other because when it hits the fan, we won't have time to build trust. What he's saying here is you've got to know each other. If if the only time you interact with a department head, with a fire chief or a police chief from a nearby city is in the middle of a crisis, you can't surge trust. You've got to build the trust before it's needed. And there's a lot of evidence. For example, I read a book by the CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation, and he describes how critical it is that leaders of organizations in the nonprofit arena know each other so they can know who to call and who to rely on. Chapter three, when in command, command, be confident in yourself. This is what I think we ought to do. You don't do that arbitrarily. You don't do that, you know, uh, ruling over people. You listen to their input. But when a decision has to be made, um, I live in the Dallas area, and I've been more than once to the George W. Bush Museum and Library. And you might remember that there was a phrase. It was a difficult time. 9-11 had occurred. And Bush said, I had to be the decider. Well, in a real sense, the leader has to be the decider. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chapter four, my favorite story in the book, almost. Let's call it my second favorite. We all have our frog floats, have a little humility. So Admiral McRaven was not yet Admiral. He was new. He was a, a young officer. He was called in by his commanding officer, and he was said, he, he was told, I've got a job for you. And he said, I couldn't wait. I thought I would be go tackling an enemy and defeating an enemy. And he said, the college over here is having a homecoming parade, and we get to build a float for it. You're in charge of the float. And McRaven said, I didn't let him know, but I was so dispirited. I thought I'd be given an important task, and I was given this menial task. I walked out, and the top non-commissioned officer, they're always the best, saw his face looking despondent, sat him down, said, what happened? He told him. He said, who do you think you are? That job needs to be done well. You go build the best damn float you can build. And he said, we won the contest, but I learned that every job you have has to be done well. Have a little humility. Um, chapter five, I've got to fly through this. The only best day was yesterday. Chapter six, run to the sound of the guns. Be aggressive in solving problems. Uh, think about the shooting at the school in Uvalde and the people that did not go in and stop the shooter. Turn to page nine, top of the page. This is my favorite story. Chapter seven, sua sponte, encourage your employees to take the initiative. Do not ever let anybody say, that's not my job. So here's the story. There was a, an award ceremony, military personnel, lots of people there, everybody in uniform, and a man who had been wounded, no longer had legs, was at a microphone speaking. He was being given an award and he was speaking. And the microphone was not placed well for the audience to hear. And from about the second or third row, in the middle of the row, a, a military person, I forget which branch, stood up, walked around, everybody went and adjusted the microphone made sure it was working, went back to his seat. Admiral McRaven walked up to that man afterwards and said, was that your job? He said, no, sir. He said, why did you do it? It's, it's right here at the end of this point. Sir, something had to be done and no one else was doing it. So I thought it was up to me. Sua sponte, of your own accord, that's a great point.
And that's a great story. Well, um, chapter eight, be prepared to take risks. He, he who dares wins. Chapter nine, hope is not a strategy. You've got a plan. Chapter 10, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Have a plan B. There's a great book I presented by one of the um, Dan and, uh, okay, anyway, on getting ready for problems in advance. It'll come to me. Um, chapter uh, 11, it pays to be a winner, establish standards of conduct and performance. Chapter 12, spend time on the factory floor. Turn to page 10. Um, I'm not even going to have time to read them. Look at chapter 18, always have a swim buddy. And then page 11, conclusion, it's simple. A young officer went to a general and he said, sir, how do I become a general? And the, the general said, you have to do this kind of reading and this kind of preparation and this kind of serving. And you've got to do it constantly. And he said, oh, and that's how I become a, a general. Look at the quote here. He says, wow, and that's how you make general? Nah, replies the general. That's how you make first lieutenant. Just keep repeating it and let them see what you've got. Well, the rest of this next couple of pages are examples of Admiral McRaven's own summaries of the chapter. Now look at page 12, and I've got my six lessons and takeaways. I'm already one minute over. I'll fly through these. Number one, lead and manage by walking around by showing up, even fully sharing the grunt work. That's the first lesson. Number two, morale really, really matters. Reputation, trustworthiness, all of that impacts morale. Every leader understands that nothing is more important to the success of a mission than the morale of the troops but leaders often misunderstand the nature of morale. Morale is not just about the employees feeling good. It is about the employees feeling valued. It is about the troops believing that their leader is listening to their concerns. Number three, something will go wrong. It will. Plan for something to go wrong. It is about the having a plan B and then a plan C and so on. Number four, always a pay, pay attention to the need to be a person of integrity. Protect the reputation of the organization. Number five, learn to listen to everybody on the team, people in every position on the team, and then actually listen. And number six, work hard, really hard on every menial task to every grand vision and plan. The wisdom of the bullfrog, leadership made simple but not easy. I hope you found this useful. I'm putting my headphones back on. Chrissy, you can start asking me questions. Excellent. Well, first I want to say, Randy, wow, that was awesome and inspiring. So Thank you very much. Um, I really do appreciate it. We did get at least one question. Do you know what your next book will be yet, Randy? I'm sorry? Do you know what your next book will be that you cover in one of our Wednesday webinars? Have we established that yet? Um, for some reason, I'm not hearing you clearly. So I'm sorry. Okay. Say it again. Do you know what your next book will be? Oh, the next <laughs> book. Uh, yeah, I can find it as we as we keep talking. So give okay, me a perfect. minute. And I, I want you everybody to know that I really pushed hard for presenting the book, The Illustrated History of Professional Wrestling. But I could not convince Krissa or Mike Mowry or Ron Hollifield to let me do that. So that's that's my uh, fallback favorite book. And I am Maybe we should sort do of teasing. Poll. I can launch a poll, I think, and people can vote, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, I'm right. Here we go. The next book is Right Kind of Wrong, 
It is by Amy Edmondson, who wrote the earlier book, The Fearless Organization. She is the originator and the guru on psychological safety. And Right Kind of Wrong is about the right way to learn from your mistakes. And it won the Financial Times Business Book of the Year Award for 2023. It's a great book. And um, so Amy Edmondson, Right Kind of Wrong, Psychological Safety Guru next month. So that's the next book, Chris. Awesome. Well, and also just a quick plug for next week. And then we do have a question we're going to get to also. But I'm going to drop this link in the chat because um, next Wednesday, we have Joe Mazzola joining us to do a session on best places to work in DFW, a case study. So Joe's with the city of McKinney. And I think it's going to be a really great um, experience and session, very educational. So I hope you all will register for that one as well. But also, we did get a great question, oh, two great questions. Sorry, I've missed one in here. But um, this one is from Dan. And Dan, feel free to, if you want to ask it directly, otherwise I will read it for you. Um, but it is, can we expect the Citizens Against Virtually Everything, CAVE, the acronym, to get on board? And how do we lead them? Is it possible? They are typically the hardest to get to know and lead. This is about getting the citizens on board. Is that what you said? Yeah, and specifically the citizens who are against everything. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I, I really hate to break this to you, but there are always going to be people against everything. So, so we start with that. And I don't have a solution to that. But what I do know is that there are some old rules about building relationships that are always valuable. They are first, and this sounds incredibly basic, but this book was about simple and basic. Pay attention to them as a person. Get to know them as a person. If, if you have a chance to notice that they go to their children or grandchildren's soccer games, then somehow say something valuable or, or encouraging about the youth soccer in your city. Do something to build a bridge to that person as a person. And so that's the first recommendation. Uh, the second recommendation is uh, take into, into heart the idea of walking the line, trooping the line, management by walking around, become better known by multiple citizens. And then they'll know you, and if they trust you, they'll defend you to this person. And then, um, let me think how to say this. Um, years ago, I read a book on persuasion, and it said, you cannot persuade the hardcore opponent to become a supporter, but you can build relationships with allies people that they know, but agree with you, and maybe they'll carry part of the torch for you. So those are three little suggestions that I would give to tackle that question. But Krista, that's the best I can do on that. Hey, I, I think that's a good answer. And I think it's a question that we, we always ask ourselves, you know, over and over. We're always trying. Uh, I have another good one for you. This one's from Peggy. How do leaders recharge? We can give and give, and it can be very tiring. Does that mean we may not be leader quality? I don't know that that one would impact the leader quality thing. Everybody suffers burnout and stress. Many people do. And so let me tackle this for a minute. Uh, first, There's a book uh, by a man named Tony Schwartz called The Power of Full Engagement. Uh, Tony Schwartz, in that book, and he, he's done some great coaching of high-level uh, athletes, among other people. Uh, there's another book by Dane Jensen called The Power of Pressure. And they both have some real practical advice. For example, 
in the Tony Schwartz book, he says, you've got to find a way to stop and unload and switch gears. So he uses this example in the book. This is a book from years ago. He says, so many people drive home after work. And when they get home, they've still got work on their shoulders. And they are kind of abrupt and not all that approachable for their children, their spouse, their uh, significant other. And so, so they're always on. I plead guilty to that. I plead guilty to that. And so Tony Schwartz says, on the drive home, stop at a park near your house. Get out of the car and walk around the park for a minute or two, just a couple of minutes, and say to yourself, I'm leaving work, I'm going home. And, and you, in your mind, leave work and head to home. So he says, you switch gears that way. So that's a practical suggestion. In the book, The Power of Pressure, um, boy, there's a lot of growing research on this. But Dane Jensen describes the absolute value of stopping to breathe. He has a great story about a woman athlete who had used breathing, deep breathing, as part of her training and getting ready. She was a, 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 an Olympic level skater of getting ready to do her routine. And then she became a broadcaster. And one time at, at a, I think it was a Super Bowl, um, she was told she was about to interview President George H.W. Bush in two minutes. And she didn't know this was going to happen. And she got around the corner, sat down and breathed. She just breathed. And then she was able to go in. So those are examples, but, but to tackle the question more directly, I think you have to carve out time to build your intellectual and inner life. And, and you can call that what you want, but if the only thing you read during the week is emails and memos and minutes of meetings, if you are not reading a book or a couple of books, a chapter or two at a time, to kind of build your intellectual foundation, to build your inner foundation. If you're not doing something to, here's a word worth writing down, replenish what is spent. If you're not replenishing what is spent, then you're gonna be running out of energy and knowledge and gas and emotion. So I don't know if any of that helps, but those are some of my answers to that very important question. I think that's great. We have a few more. I want to get to at least two more. Um, okay, sorry. Um, but one of the two of the questions, actually, I'm going to combine because I think you can cover both in one answer. Um, so one of them is about the most effective way to communicate these principles to a team. And then other one is somewhat similar. And if I'm getting, if I'm misunderstanding the intention of the question, correct me. But the other one is what is the best way to deliver these principles to our teams that do not have leadership practices in agreement with the, with the principles? Okay. Uh, first of all, the issue of communication is a whoppingly big issue overall. Um, in July for this webinar, we have planned for me to present the book briefing on a book called Smart Brevity. And it is a terrific new book on communication. But let me give you something simple. You've got this handout. Why don't you take a blank copy of this handout? Why don't you take your pen, <clears throat> excuse me, and put a box around, you know, one or two quotes per page and then in your next staff meeting, team meeting, say, let me read you 10 excerpts of a book we heard presented on leadership by the great Admiral McRaven. Let me read these and let's talk about how we can implement them in our team. Uh, the idea of cascading down the information you gain from webinars like this 
we fail at that level. We take it in, we don't cascade it down. And so don't expect people to read it on their own. You walk into a meeting with them and you read, take five minutes, that's all you need. You read five minutes and you say, let's implement these. So that is one way to do it. Uh, the second way to do it is that, that let's remember that your team members are human beings. Uh, I could point to a number of books. I first read it from a man named Vern Harnish, who said, when you start a team meeting, just spend a couple of minutes talking about something good that's happening in our lives away from work. Talk about your grandchildren. Talk about, uh, I went to a kindergarten basketball game. Everybody ought to see one in their life for our grandson last weekend. Talk about something that brings joy and life and, and, and meaning in a way that before you get down to business, you remember these are human beings. So Chris, those are some of the things that I would recommend. Excellent. Okay. I want to get to this question um, because this is something that Randy and you and I have talked about often. Um, so this question is in point number 35, leaders must be bold. Is this gender specific? Because when women exhibit boldness and strength, it is not interpreted correctly. All right. It's quote number 35. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and this basically is interesting. asking about the differences. All right. Okay. Um, every great leader must, let me read it, must exhibit a sense of boldness because the rank and file don't want to follow a timid soul. Okay. This is big. Um, People seemed, boy, this is really delicate. People seem to respond to big, bold bombast. Bombastic words, big gestures. I'm, I'm a fairly bold speaker. The problem is that that kind of person can walk all over more timid people. And when the timid people, more timid people are walked over, then they become even more timid. And that's a problem. Um, the very famous design firm IDEO in uh, California, which is a great firm, has a rule that when you're brainstorming, the leader is not allowed to speak. Not allowed to speak. Um, Charles Duhigg in the book, I think it's The Power of Habit, but it could have been his second book, Smarter, Faster, Better. Charles Duhigg says that Google learned that you have to literally make people shut up in team meetings to let everybody speak. And until everybody has a check mark for every time they speak in about equal number, then you have not had a good team meeting. And so last of all is men boy, the research is clear on this, speak over women in team meetings and take credit for the women's ideas, which is not good. Um, Charles Duhigg wrote that the research says the more women on a team, actually the better execution of the ideas happen. And he says, we're not just talking about 50-50. Seven women and three men is better than five and five, and eight women and two men is even better. So um, I don't know a solution to saying that, that people don't respond well to bold, bombastic, but I do think that gender differences require some different thought about that. Uh, women can be bold, but in general, men are louder and overwhelming. So Krissa, that's just a, me, a lot of rambling tackling that question. You know, it reminded me a lot of the one of the conversations we have had and you recommended the book Fierce Leadership to me. And yeah. I have I have recommended that to a lot of other people along the way. That was what, I don't know, 
15 plus years ago. And I yeah, still that, it. A Fierce Leadership by Susan Scott. It's a very good book. That's who the author is. Fierce Leadership. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Oh, we had a question that's who said this? And I'm sorry, I don't know exactly which. I, I didn't see exactly when that came in. So it's from L.I. Gibbon, but I don't know what that person is referring to. Yeah, I apologize. If you can clarify, we can answer that really fast before we wrap. I'm putting a link to Randy's website in the chat. Um, and then I'm going to actually put this one more time. The email, if you want to book Randy to come and speak to your team or your organization, please email training at governmentresource.com. And uh, we're offering a 10% off as well. Chris, let happy. me say you can tell from today that I wish I'd had an hour to an hour and a half to talk about this one book. So I that's what I do. That that's way, what right? I do when I come into an organization. Yeah. I think we all agree. We wish we had more time with you, but um, but that's good because we will be back with you next month. And uh, if you didn't see the link in the chat, you can register for that on the SGR website. Go to Wednesday webinars and you'll see it there. Also, feel free to email me with any questions, but we appreciate your time, Randy, and we appreciate everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Krissa. Thank See you. you. Next time.